Chapter 10 of In His Steps. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Vaughn Ullman. In His Steps by Charles Monroe Sheldon. Chapter 10. If any man serve me, let him follow me. It was nearly midnight before the services at the rectangle closed. Gray stayed up long into Sunday morning, praying and talking with a little group of converts, who in the great experiences of their new life clung to the evangelist with a personal helplessness that made it as impossible for him to leave them as if they had been depending on him to save them from physical death. Among these converts was Roland Page. Virginia and her uncle had gone home about eleven o'clock, and Rachel and Jasper Chase had gone with them as far as the avenue where Virginia lived. Dr. West had walked on a little way with them to his own home, and Rachel and Jasper had then gone on together to her mother's. That was a little after eleven. It was now striking midnight, and Jasper Chase sat in his room staring at the papers on his desk, and going over the last half hour with painful persistence. He had told Rachel Winslow of his love for her, and she had not given him her love in return. It would be difficult to know what was most powerful in the impulse that had moved him to speak to her tonight. He had yielded to his feelings without any special thought of results to himself, because he had felt so certain that Rachel would respond to his love. He tried to recall the impression she had made on him when he first spoke to her. Never had her beauty and her strength influenced him as tonight. While she was singing he saw and heard no one else. The tent swarmed with a confused crowd of faces, and he knew he was sitting there hemmed in by a mob of people, but they had no meaning to him. He felt powerless to avoid speaking to her. He knew he should speak when they were alone. Now that he had spoken, he felt that he had misjudged either Rachel or the opportunity. He knew, or thought he knew, that she had begun to care something for him. It was no secret between them that the heroine of Jasper's first novel had been his own ideal of Rachel, and the hero in the story was himself, and they had loved each other in the book, and Rachel had not objected. No one else knew. The names and characters had been drawn with a subtle skill that revealed to Rachel, when she received a copy of the book from Jasper, the fact of his love for her, and she had not been offended. That was nearly a year ago. Tonight he recalled the scene between them with every inflection and movement unerased from his memory. He even recalled the fact that he began to speak just at the point on the avenue where, a few days before, he had met Rachel walking with Roland Page. He had wondered at the time what Roland was saying. Rachel, Jasper had said, and it was the first time he had ever spoken her first name. I never knew till tonight how much I loved you. Why should I try to conceal any longer what you have seen me look? You know I love you as my life. I can no longer hide it from you if I would. The first intimation he had of a repulse was the trembling of Rachel's arm in his. She had allowed him to speak and had neither turned her face toward him nor away from him. She had looked straight on and her voice was sad but firm and quiet when she spoke. Why do you speak to me now? I cannot bear it after what we've seen tonight. Why? What? He had stammered and then was silent. Rachel withdrew her arm from his, but still walked near him. Then he had cried out with the anguish of one who begins to see a great loss facing him where he had expected a great joy. Rachel, do you not love me? Is not my love for you as sacred as anything in all of life itself? She had walked silent for a few steps after that. They passed a street lamp. Her face was pale and beautiful. He had made a movement to clutch her arm, and she had moved a little further from him. No. She had replied, There was a time I cannot answer that for you. Should not have spoken to me now. He had seen in these words his answer. He was extremely sensitive. Nothing short of a joyous response to his own love would ever have satisfied him. He could not think of pleading with her. Sometime when I am more worthy, he had asked in a low voice, but she did not seem to hear. And they had parted at her home, and he recalled vividly the fact that no good night had been said. Now, as he went over the brief but significant scene, he lashed himself for his foolish precipitancy. He had not ra count reckoned on Rachel's tense, passionate absorption of all of her feelings in the scenes at the tent, which were so new in her mind. But he did not know her well enough even yet to understand the meaning of her refusal. 
When the clock in the first church struck one, he was still sitting at his desk, staring at the last page of manuscript of his unfinished novel. Rachel went up to her room and faced her evening's experience with conflicting emotions. Had she ever loved Jasper Chase? Yes, no. One moment she felt that her life's happiness was at stake over the result of her action. Another, she had a strange feeling of relief that she had spoken as she had. There was one of great overmastering feeling in her. The response of the wretched creatures in the tent to her singing. The swift, powerful, awesome presence of the Holy Spirit had affected her as never in all her life before. The moment Jasper had spoken her name and she realized that he was telling her of his love, she had felt a sudden revulsion for him, as if he should have respected the supernatural events they had just witnessed. She felt as if it was not the time to be absorbed in anything less than the divine glory of those conversions. The thought that all the time she was singing with the one passion of her soul to touch the conscience of that tent full of sin, Jasper Chase had been unmoved by it except to love her for herself, gave her a shock as of a reverence on her part as well as on his. She could not tell why she felt as she did, only she knew that if he had not told her tonight, she would have still felt the same toward him she always had. What was that feeling? What had he been to her? Had she made a mistake? She went to her bookcase and took out the novel which Jasper had given her. Her face deepened in color as she turned to certain passages which she had read often, and which she knew Jasper had written for her. She read them again. Somehow they failed to touch her strongly. She closed the book and let it lie on the table. She gradually felt that her thought was busy with the sights she had witnessed in the tent. Those faces, men and women, touched for the first time with the Spirit's glory. What a wonderful thing life was, after all. The complete regeneration revealed in the sight of drunken, vile, debauched humanity kneeling down to give itself to a life of purity and Christ-likeness. Oh, it was surely a witness to the superhuman in the world, and the face of Roland Page by the side of that miserable wreck out of the gutter. She could recall, as if she now saw it, Virginia crying with her arms about her brother just before she left the tent, and Mr. Gray kneeling close by, and the girl Virginia had taken into her heart while she whispered something to her before she went out. All these pictures, drawn by the Holy Spirit and the human tragedies, brought to a climax there in the most abandoned spot in all Raymond, stood out in Rachel's memory now, a memory so recent that her room seemed for a time to continue being to contain all the actors in their movements. No, no, she said aloud. He had no right to speak after all that. He should have respected the place where our thoughts should have been. I'm sure I do not love him, not enough to give him my life. And after she had thus spoken, the evening's experience of the tent came crowding in again, thrusting out all of the things. It is perhaps the most striking evidence of the tremendous spiritual factor which had now entered the rectangle, that Rachel felt, even when the great love of a strong man had come very near to her, that the spiritual manifestation moved her with an agitation far greater than anything Jasper had felt for her personally, or she for him. The people of Raymond awoke Sunday morning to a growing knowledge of events, which were beginning to revolutionize many of the regular customary habits of the town. Alexander Powers's action in the matter of the railroad frauds had created sensation, not only in Raymond, but throughout the country. Edward Norman's daily changes of policy in the conduct of his paper had startled the community and caused more comment than any recent political event. Rachel Winslow singing at the rectangle meetings had made a stir in society and excited the wonder of all her friends. Virginia's conduct, her presence every night with Rachel, her absence from the usual circle of her wealthy, fashionable acquaintances, had furnished a great deal of material for gossip and question. In addition to these events which centered about these persons who were so well known, there had been, all through the city, in very many homes and in businesses and social circles, strange things happening. Nearly one hundred persons in Henry Maxwell's church had made the pledge to do everything after asking, What would Jesus do? And the result had been, in many cases, unheard of actions. The city was stirred as it had never been before. As a climax to the weak events had come the spiritual manifestation at the rectangle, and the announcement which came to most people before church time of the actual conversion at the tent of nearly fifty of the worst characters in that neighborhood, together with the con, the conversion of Roland Page, the well-known society and club man. It is no wonder that under the pressure of all this, the First Church of Raymond came to the morning service in a condition that made it quickly sensitive to any large truth. 
Perhaps nothing had astonished the people more than the great change that had come over the minister, since he had proposed to them the imitation of Jesus in conduct. The dramatic delivery of his sermons no longer impressed them. The self-satisfied, contented, easy attitude of the fine figure and refined face in the pulpit had been displaced by a manner that could not be compared with the old style of his delivery. The sermon had become a message. It was no longer delivered. It was brought to them with a love, an earnestness, a passion, a desire, a humility that poured its enthusiasm about the truth, and made the speaker no more prominent than he had to be as a living voice of God. His prayers were unlike any the people had ever heard before. They were often broken. Even once or twice they had actually been ungrammatical in a phrase or two. When had Henry Maxwell so far forgotten himself in a prayer as to make a mistake of that sort? He knew that he had often taken as much pride in the diction delivery of his prayers as of his sermons. Was it possible he now so abhorred the elegant refinement of a formal public petition that he purposely chose to rebuke himself for his previous precise manner of prayer? It is more likely that he had no thought of all that. His great longing to voice the needs and wants of his people made him unmindful of an occasional mistake. It is certain that he had never prayed so effectively as he did now. There are times when a sermon has a value and power due to conditions in the audience rather than anything new or startling, or eloquent in the words said or arguments presented. Such conditions faced Henry Maxwell this morning as he preached against the saloon. According to his purpose, determined on the week before. He had no new statements to make about the evil influence of the saloon in Raymond. What new facts were there? He had no startling illustrations of the power of the saloon in business or politics. What could he say that had not been said by temperance orators a great many times? The effect of his message this morning owed its power to the unusual fact of his preaching about the saloon at all, together with the events that had stirred the people. He had never in the course of his ten years pastorate mentioned the saloon as something to be regarded in the light of an enemy, not only to the poor and tempted, but to the business life of the place and the church itself. He spoke now with a freedom that seemed to measure his complete sense of conviction that Jesus would speak so. At the close, he pleaded with the people to remember the new light that had begun at the rectangle. The regular election of city officers was near at hand. The question of license would be an issue in the election. What of the poor creatures surrounded by the hell of drink, while just beginning to feel the joy of deliverance from sin? Who could tell what depended on their environment? Was there one word to be said by the Christian disciple, businessman, citizen, in favor of continuing the license to crime and shame-producing institutions? Was not the most Christian thing they could do to act as citizens in the matter, fight the saloon at the polls, elect good men to city offices, and clean the municipality? How much had prayers helped to make Raymond better, while votes and actions had really been on the side of the enemies of Jesus? Would not Jesus do this? What disciple could imagine him refusing to suffer or to take up his cross in this matter? How much had the members of the first church ever suffered in an attempt to imitate Jesus? Was Christian discipleship a thing of conscience simply, of custom, of tradition? Where did the suffering come in? Was it necessary in order to follow Jesus' steps to go up to Calvary as well as the Mount of Transfiguration? His appeal was stronger at this point than he knew. It is not too much to say that the spiritual tension of the people reached its highest point right there. The imitation of Jesus, which had begun with the volunteers in the church, was working like leaven in the organization. And Henry Maxwell would even thus, early in his life, have been amazed if he could have measured the extent of desire on the part of his people to take up the cross. While he was speaking this morning, and before he closed with a loving appeal to the discipleship of two thousand years' knowledge of the Master, many a man and woman in the church was saying, as Rachel had said so passionately to her mother, I want to do something that will cost me something in the way of sacrifice. I am hungry to suffer something. Truly Mazzini was right when he said that no appeal is quite so powerful in the end as the call, Come and Suffer. The service was over. The great audience had gone, and Maxwell again faced the company gathered in the lecture room, as on the two previous Sundays. He had asked all to remain who had made the pledge of discipleship, and any others who wished to be included. The after-service seemed now to be a necessity. As he went in and faced the people there, his heart trembled. There were at least one hundred present. The Holy Spirit was never before so manifest. He missed Jasper Chase, but all the others were present. He asked Milton Wright to pray. The very air was charged with divine possibilities. What could resist such a baptism of power? How had they lived all these years without it? End of chapter 10 Recording by Vaughn Ullman V-O-N-S-B-O-K-S dot com